Well, good afternoon, brethren. Thank you, Mr. Shemit and the choir, and I guess all of you, the big choir, uh, for, the, for the special music. Uh, this is going to be a, uh, an interesting <laughs> setup here. I want to thank Mr. Fish ahead of time for assisting me with the, uh, the technology. So we've got uh, both Android and uh, Apple equipment up here, and there could be a feud. I'm not quite sure, but we'll, uh, we'll hope for the best. Right about now, all the Apple users saying, yeah, and the Apple will win. So let me get this. Do I need to, where'd Frank go? Do I need to maybe open this up now? See if it'll unlock? Oh, we're good. The Apple product did work. Well, it comes to an end here, doesn't it? This is it. Today is the last Sabbath. Do you know that it's been, at least in our family's experience, of the time that we've spent here in this building, off and on, it's almost a thousand Sabbaths. Uh, when we came here originally in Eagle Rock, I came a little bit before my family did. I was being transferred out here on my job. And I was trying to remember, and I had to call Mr. Fish to remind me, we've been together for a long time in this building, haven't we? And I'm going to miss this building. Um, I recall uh, initially it was Mr. Fish and Mr. Weber and Mr. Vieira. Uh, Mr. Helge came later, and we've served together for a long time. And the deacons, there's been many or, or de ordinations of deacons here. Uh, when the Webbers were reassigned here in, I think, the year 2000, correct? Is that what it was? Around 2000, give or take a few decades. Um, he asked if our family, we live in Orange County, as most of you know, if we would mind staying here instead of driving the much, much, much shorter, <laughs> much shorter distance to Garden Grove. And we said, no, we'd be, we'd be glad to stay. And we haven't regretted it. But this is indeed just a building. It is no doubt a beautiful, build, beautiful building, isn't it? And I'm always marveling when I get to see sometimes what you can't see, uh, the structure of this, this building it was built in the uh, 20s and 30s. Um, but it is just a place that we worship. And it is more importantly the people that is inside the building than the building itself. And for most of us, if we've been in the church for 10 or 20, 30, 40 years, this is, in our particular case for our family, this is probably because we've served on both coasts uh, in northern and southern California, this is probably our 30th or 40th building. It's just one of many. But indeed, we have spent so many, in fact, our, our time, over half our time here uh, with you. As Mr. Weber had said before, I am reminded, uh, especially as we look out on all the many people, friends that have, uh, uh, who have died, who we have, we have buried here, and those that we have married here, and those that we have remembered here, uh, those indeed we have baptized. One of my children was baptized in this building. So this is an important building to us, but I'm not Lot's, Lot's wife, and yet I will miss the old building. It's been good to us. It's been good to all of us, but enough of that. Let's discuss today on our last Sabbath, the last Sabbath of the pagan Roman year, right? Right? Absolutely. Come on. I told Mr. Dr. Hoover, I said, this is our last gig here, so let's make it memorable. So I'm going to en encourage you to incorporate yourself a little bit into the message. It's okay. Nobody's going to uh, be sent to the lake of fire for it. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. But on our last Sabbath of the Roman year, the end of the world, let's discuss that. Wouldn't that be appropriate? Wouldn't that be appropriate to discuss the end of the world? Well, that's exactly what we're going to do. Kind of. Though appropriate it may be. So if you'll turn with me to Daniel chapter 12. Mr. Fish was talking about doing a sermonette. And for all of you who do speak, those of you that have given nothing but sermonettes, those are harder to give. I, th I think the elders would agree. Those are harder to give as a, a 12, not a 20, but a 12 to 15 minute discussion is much, much more difficult than rambling on uh, for 40 or 50 or two hours. Some sermons are much easier to do. But you're going to get something hopefully a little bit in between. So in Daniel chapter 12, it is a book of prophecy. It is a book of last things. It's a book of eschatology where everything is revealed. 
By the way, this podium is going to take some used to getting used to. Becky told me, she said, make sure your tie is straight, make sure you're, it's straight and everything is where it should be. I said, okay, because that you they can see, she said, and don't stand on one leg, don't fidget. She said, you have a tendency, she said, to tap your foot and to wrap the other leg around the other leg. You can't do that anymore. <laughs> so I've got to be professional in front of this very clear <laughs> pulpit. And so it's a book of eschatology, and this is the end. It talks about the end, so we want to turn to the end. And what's the end of Daniel? Chapter 12. Turn there, if you would, with me. Daniel, as you may remember, just as a, a quick recap, in case you haven't read recently the book of Daniel, it's a book of kingdoms. It's a book of the Babylonian, the Assyrian, the Greek, and the Roman empires as they successively ruled the world. It talks about an image of gold. It has one of the longest prophecies in the entire Bible, which this culminates in chapter 12, uh, where God describes the se sequence of events that will lead up to the end of the world. And each kingdom in its succession falls, either collectively or individually, against the kingdom of God. They are struck down, as it were, by an unseen hand. If that weren't epic enough, it's couched in symbolism and images and beasts and books, little books, sealed and unsealed, and yet very enigmatic. It doesn't give us a translation for the 21st century, nor did it for the 19th, or the 17th, or the 12th. And so this book has been debated and analyzed, and people have speculated about it for thousands of years, ever since it was written and revealed. It is also paralleled in a New Testament book that we know. Does anybody know what that book is? book of Revelation. And so Daniel and Revelation are very often paired together. And you'll see as we read just in this one chapter some references or some images, some imagery to the book of Revelation, which has again more images and more beasts. And yet they're still not revealed, even the book of Revelation as we know, in today's understanding. But Daniel is also a book of times. In fact, the word time is used eight times nine, in some cases, some translation, ten different times in these few short 13 verses. This is a very short little book. It's a book of times. And so you'll notice, and I'd like you to, is ask you when we read this just to look at the structure, the repetition of many of the words. They're there for a reason. When you, once again, when you write a letter or when you talk to someone and you repeat a word again and again and again, you do it for a very specific reason. You want it emphasized because it's important. And Daniel does that in this very book. So, in chapter 12, as we said, it has some very enigmatic phrasing. But I think there's also some very, very clear phrasing. And I searched, I counted up close to 12 different commentaries and looked at probably 15 to 20 different articles. And very rarely did these, this underlying issue come up. And I'd like to explore Daniel chapter 12 with you today in that light. So today, it's my privilege to discuss with you today Daniel 12, which again relates to the end of the world, of the end time, of images and beasts and events. But let's look at something that belongs to wisdom, and that wisdom is involved in not understanding. So let's read through it to get a feel for it. I'm going to read through it without any comment. It's a very short book. Verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands, watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to the righteousness are like the stars forever and ever. Whoops. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this river bank and the other on that river bank. And one said to the, the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven 
and swore by him who lives forever, and it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. And although I heard, I did not understand. And I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from time, the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you go, to the, wait, go your way till the end. For you shall rest. You shall rest and will rise to your inheritance at the end of the days. It's a lot there. I think it took me all of a couple minutes to read it. It's a short book. There's a lot in that book, and I'm sure as, as, as we read, and you've read it before, your mind raced to the different numbers and the times and possibly articles or booklets or even videos that you'd seen that describes these events. It's a very sad time. It's a time when everything is coming to an end. It's being finalized and finished up. Let's identify some of these. Recall where Daniel was. If you remember, he was in Babylon. He was in captivity. He'd been taken away because of the sins primarily of Judah, but by extension Israel, their sins and their idolatry. His name had been changed to Belteshazzar. Everything that he knew had been changed. And yet, you can read the book, everything was revealed to him there in that time. And the time is important. And God had engineered all of the captivity and all of the visions and all of this book. So I want you to recall this context so that we can focus on the words in front of us. Verses 1 through 3, you may see it in your Bible, is kind of offset. And it, it means that it stands alone. It can be off, looked as upon poetry or some saying. It stands alone within the context of the book. So let's just read a couple of them because it's important of these verses. Verse 1, at that time... Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there should be a time of trouble. There's time again. Such as never was, there was a nation even to that time. Think he's re repeating the word time for a reason? And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. What time? The ending of man's rule. When everything that man has done comes to a final climax. And God comes back at that time. Also understand that the, this, although it's the culmination of man's rule, it is also a specific point in time. Many of you may know that uh, United has or will begin a series of personal appearance campaigns. And anybody know what the title is? Does anybody know? Yes, ma'am. America, your, t your time is now, yeah. So it's about time. And I didn't, I didn't know that until I was well into the well into this message. So, and it includes prophecy, which is not my focus here today, but time is important. Many of you may have a watch on your wrist. You may have a watch in your pocket. I know you have it on your phone. I have it on mine. We have it in the back of the room. Time's important. I have to be done in time. We have to arrive on time. I'm taking my, uh, my, uh, I said my father-in-law, uh, my brother-in-law and his, his uh, wife from Ohio, uh, this is their first time together to uh, California, and we spent the last three or four days together visiting things that all of us take for granted, and I'll get to that in just a second. But we've got a flight to catch tonight. We can't be late. They're not going to hold the flight for us. We paid a ticket. They paid a ticket just like everybody else, and we show up five minutes late. Guess what? We've got them for another week, <laughs> and I'm sure they'd like to go home. So everything about time is important. Who is Michael? Michael is one of the archangels in the Old Testament. The thinking is that in, in Old Testament days that the, a lot of the angels, especially the archangels, like Michael and maybe Gabriel, watched over certain cities and certain groups of people. In fact, it says here, at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Who are your people? Well, if he's talking to Daniel, is Daniel an Italian? A Corsican? Is he an Englishman? 
No, he's talking about the Jewish people. So he says he stands watch over the Jewish people, your people, he says. So this sets more of a focus on it. He says they will be delivered. Why, where would they be delivered from? They're going to be delivered from captivity. It says, your people, there will be a time of trouble, but they will be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. What's the book? The book is the only book that matters. It's the only book that is the most important book. This book is important, but there's a book that's even more important. It's the book of life. It's interesting, if you ever want to look at where the book of life technically originated, we see it in Exodus, anybody know? This is an audience response if you wish. Moses, what book? Come on, let's go. I'll give you 30 seconds. Tell me what book it's in. What book is it in? Huh? I don't want to think. Look it up. Google it. We'll get to that in a little bit. Very, it's good. Though. Ward, chapter 32 of Exodus, verse 32. By the way, I looked it up. I Googled it. And so that's the book of life. And this book is so important because your name must be written in the book to be a part of God's plan. He talks about two different groups in verses 2 through 4. He says many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Doesn't say all. It says many. What's many mean? It means a lot. It doesn't mean everybody, but it doesn't mean nobody. So many will, who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, and they shall awake to everlasting life. But he draws, he draws a comparison. It's, it's one that's in Matthew and most of the Gospels. There are two types, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The righteous and the unrighteous. Jesus says this in the book of John. He says there'll be the resurrection of the righteous and there'll be a resurrection of the unrighteous. And they were those that have slept. But there's also groups. He says, and those who are wise... Some translations will say those who have insight, those who have understanding, those who have understanding are wise, have insight, they shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, the stars in the heavens, the stars and the planets of the, of the heavens. And those who turn many to righteousness, another group, they are like the stars forever and ever. And you can already see, you can already pick up, as important as some of these prophecies are, the book of life, the deliverance of the Jewish people from captivity. These are important concepts. But there's also a, another concept that's starting to be, that's underlying. It seems secondary because it's so rarely ever commented on. He's talking about wisdom, insight, righteousness. These are important things. These are identifiers and marks of the people who will rise in the judgment of the righteous. Those who know, those who understand, those who have wisdom. And that's what we want to talk about today, is wisdom in a certain type of understanding. And so this often missed aspect, this is what I hope to show, because there's a lot of numbers we're going to get into and a lot of theology. And I think the church over the, the decades, many churches has. In fact, the church that we, we rent from and keep renting from, the Adventists, this is one of their most important books. They study this chapter and this book. You cannot believe it. I have Four of the commentaries I have are Adventist commentaries. They write copiously on these subjects because it's an important subject. But I think there's also an underlying point here. These two groups, they have insight, they have wisdom. And some, in fact, lead others. They lead other people, it says, to righteousness. So we know at least four things about these folks with Daniel. They are Daniel's people who will be delivered. They will be, uh, uh, they will be delivered from the captivity that they have. Those that are resurrected to righteousness, they're written in the book. Those that are not are not. They also have wisdom. And they also lead others to righteousness or righteous understanding. So we know that about them. And that's important. In verse 4, something very interesting, he says, But you, Daniel, this is the, the image of the man who's talking to him. You, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book until the time of the end. Until the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Oh, boy. Let's see. 
I've got a call. I'll ignore it. We'll get to that in a second. I've got a lot of technology up here. You'll understand why in a minute. He says to close or shut up the book until the time of the end, to seal it. And when we see seal it, he means to close it and to put an imperture on it, much like a, a, a notary on it, a, a stamp, a seal, of its authenticity, of its importance. But what's interesting here is when he tells it to seal it, he's telling Daniel, you can't open it until when? The time of the end. You can't open this, this book, this scroll, this information until it is the time of the end and, and not before. Now I want you to picture this from Daniel's perspective. Daniel has just for 12 chapters had one vision after another, far, far more than any of us will ever, ever have, I, I hope. And now he's told to shut it up and to wait till the time of the end. And then it will be opened. I'm not sure Daniel's really happy about this. Now, what's interesting with this stealer, this stamp, it's, it's, it's sealed until the time of the end, and he makes this very interesting ver uh, phrase. People will move back and forth, to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. How many of you have ever read an article from the church on running to and fro, and knowledge shall increase? Half, three quarters of you. If you go up on the UCG or any of the Churches of God website and type in increase in knowledge, stand back. It is a heavily commented on phrase and reference. Its understanding over the years, especially in popular biblical literature, speaks usually to modernity of technology. This stuff. Modernity of technology, of information technology then information or knowledge will increase and people will run back and forth in an effort to acquire this knowledge. And that is important. So it almost seems like a frantic, a rush to know more. But linguistically, when you look at those that, that read the, the Hebrew and the Septuagint and the Greek, when you read the analytics of the verse, it is not talking about modernity of technology. It is talking about the time of the end where people will run or look at over and over and over again this book. And they want the knowledge that is in this book. So maybe we didn't have the primary analysis correct. But I think you would agree that when we read it without knowledge about the language behind it, we would agree today, right now, knowledge is increasing at an ever-increasing rate. In fact, it is a rush to know more. So there's really two concepts. We're going to look at them separately and together. Now, unfortunately, many of the younger people, not all, many of the younger people are out on winter break, but they would have with them a number of tools. So those of us, I think a lot of us have those tools with us. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to give you one minute to please give me this answer. I don't care who it is, as soon as you have the answer, I want you to please raise your hand and you must have all the questions answered. Here's the question. On what date, what date, and where did Napoleon Bonaparte die? I want the day, the year, and where did Napoleon Bonaparte die? As soon as you have the answer, raise your hand. No guessing, you gotta get all the answers correct. One minute, go. You're never going to get asked this again, and I may be chastised later for even asking you. Yes, sir. Better be right. Where? No, no, I'd give me some island. Five, four, three. Huh? No, 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 no. No, 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 we, you get, see how this gets out of hand? Yes, sir, Alex in the back? No, want all of it together. All of it together. Why is this so difficult? Mr. Delamater. I don't want to hear it. Correct. How did he know that? 
He Googled it. What's the other verb? He wikied it. By the way, that's how I got that information. <laughs> now, you may be asking yourself, what a crazy question. That's excellent. Thank you. I thank you all of you for trying it. I thought that was good. Uh, it was good participation. Now, many may say, who cares? Who cares when Napoleon Bonaparte died or where he died? Who cares? The guy's dead. Right? Well, I, I cared because I wanted to ask that question. <laughs> you all, not all of you, but many of you were just crazy enough to meet the challenge. It proves the point, because I have another question for you. We have at our fingertips vast amounts of knowledge. And by the way, you did it in 38 seconds. How tall was Napoleon? Very good. You see how quickly, because they, they looked it up. Do you see the world that we live in? We live in a world of information. It's minutia, I grant you. But, minutia, but knowledge and information nonetheless. Vast amounts of knowledge. Do you realize that the, the computing capacity of this phone that I have, it's an Android, by the way, for the record. The computing, computing capacity of this, I, this phone in 1960, do you know what the size of the building you would need? the size of this building. You would need the size of this building in 1960 to do this type of computing. Does that blow anybody's socks off? It blows mine. I can remember back in the day when I was involved in electronics up in the Silicon Valley, and we were talking about a one mil line on line spacing. It's a, just think of this, the thickness of a hair for easy reference. Lines of gold, which for memory, that would get us to one megabyte. In my phone, I have 32 megabytes. Some of your phones have 64 megabytes. The technology is ever increasing. And many people say, who cares? Well, it's important. I think it's very important. I think it's vitally important. Because what we have at our disposal are vast amounts of knowledge vast amounts of facts. Brethren, we just went through, and by now you've, uh, you've got your neighbors, and they've, some have already got the tree out into the, uh, the driveway, right? They're yanking that thing out, and they've got it on the front there. We've just gone through the Christmas observance. It was yesterday. There are gazillions of people in the malls today trying to get after Christmas sales. But you know what? What's interesting about it, I'm going to state the obvious. We do not celebrate or observe Christmas. We do not try and denigrate those that do. But here's the obvious fact. What's interesting, and maybe you'll agree with me, each, in, each passing year, I've found that more and more people, they realize and they understand very much that Christ was not born on December 25th. They know that the Christmas tree has got some pagan roots. How do they know that? They Googled it. They wikied it. It's on the, the 400 channels that you have on your TV. Only 10 of which you watch. They all know that. Guess what? They don't care. How many of you think by raise of hands that the people who observe Christmas, just as a matter of fact, how many of the people that you know that observe Christmas don't know that Christ wasn't born on December 25th. Yeah, not many hands are going up. So the vast majority of the people, they got it. Hey, we got it. You know, he doesn't, he didn't, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Do you know that Christmas tree is really a blah, 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 pagan symbol of blah, blah, for time? Yeah. Well, yeah. A mistletoe? Yeah, I know. Do you know the Yule Log's got, yeah, I know it. So what? It's the spirit of the day, and that's hard to argue with, right? Because we're trying to do it on knowledge and fact, right? Understanding, they give us emotion. So that game's lost. People, as the knowledge increases, will care less. In the main, they know it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. How could that be? 
that is counterintuitive. If there is so much knowledge, how could it be? Their eyes aren't opened? No, I think it's more than that. They don't have God's spirit? No, it's more than that. I think it's too simplistic. I think what we don't understand is that, not that they don't understand, they do understand, they don't care. And there's a difference. They have the knowledge and they don't care. The truth is therefore, what? Not important. The knowledge is there, the caring is not. Information and technology without direction, without objective or meaningful purpose is absolutely pointless. It's called noise. In your world, like my world, when I am embarrassed to say, uh, I will have in my car, we were driving all over Southern California today and I'm, I'm sure my brother and sister-in-law said, does this guy even know where he's going? I've got my, my Garmin up, I've got my phone up, right, just to triple check where we're going. I mean, these are places I've gone and, and George, my brother-in-law said, John, you're backing out of the driveway and you've, only, you've got all this equipment going on. Do you not know how to get out of the driveway? <laughs> Didn't want to answer. I was embarrassed. But we use all these technological aids, aid, aids almost unthinking. At least I speak for myself. But I have the, the radio on, usually. So maybe it's on serious, or maybe we've got a CD in the car, right? There's a siren going by uh, with a fire truck beside us, and we've got all this, inf this, this noise, all this information staring at us. The signs on the streets, this, the boards. We've got electronic boards out where we we live in Orange County, where they're constantly changing the ads on the, on the boards. You know, there was a time before this that we had this. This poor puppy. Does anybody know what this was? Those of you under 30 years old, ask someone that's older next to you what this is. This is a phone. We went from this in 1972 to this. In between, we had touch tile, right? I know, I can tell the younger people, they're looking at me like, oh, what is that? This is a phone. So this is how it works. When you needed a number, it didn't do very much. It just, it, it lets you do, uh, make a call and receive a call. That was it. To get the weather, you had to dial a number, right? To get information, you had to dial a number. Does anybody remember the number? 411. By the way, this, phone, this puppy still works. This is from Ohio Bell, by the way, all right? But you picked it up like this. It weighs about five pounds, so it could be used as a weapon in case someone broke into your house. But I, I have this in our, our den. But I want you to look at that. For 70 to 80 years, a type of phone like that existed. This is new. This tells me everything, all day long. In fact, I couldn't shut it up a few minutes ago. This old phone, this old phone. Good friend of mine, I was talking today about this subject, and he said to me, wow. By the way, he's, he's got a, uh, an iPhone, which is much, much more sophisticated than my poor Android. He said to me, you know, he got me thinking about this, and he said, uh, I put my phone down by my bedstand, and it wakes me up in the morning, my phone does. I use it as a flashlight when I get up, especially if it's dark so I can make it to the closet so I can get dressed, so it's on while I'm getting dressed. He says, then I listen to music while I'm having breakfast on my phone, and at breakfast I look at my phone while the music's on to look at the things I've got scheduled to do today on my phone. Uh, when I get in the car, I, I plug in the directions of where I'm going to go, uh, While well, I'm listening to voicemail, I'm driving, and I'm looking at directions. Uh, then he said, uh, by the way, this call's over. My battery's going dead. It was 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> what I'd like you to do, we're going to try a little technology right now. I'd like you to watch a, a short video that I think is very germane to this subject. So see if we can pull this off. I felt I could say some of the things that I, he would say better than I did. The point of the, the sermon is not that video, but I thought the video was especially important and uh, give Gary Turlock out of the UK the full credit for it. And you, uh, Gary Turk, I'm sorry. And you just type in Turk, look up, and you'll see that it's an extremely popular video. I think it's very, very important for all of us to see. 
because we were all addicted to it. Uh, poor Frank has his tablet, but I have mine. Uh, I have my smartphone. I have two laptops. Uh, I have smart TVs in our house. So as he said, maybe smart TVs, maybe not so smart people. My smartphone is required by my employer. The security emails that I have have to be uh, accessible to no one but me. They pay for unlimited data because I have to constantly download information. So my office is right here. I can be anywhere, I can be doing anything, and still be in touch. It is indeed a device of delusion. It makes me feel informed. It makes me feel I'm in touch and aware of my surroundings. It makes me feel that I'm responsive and timely and important and knowledgeable. In truth, it does none of these things. Not in truth, it's all a delusion. In fact, brethren, I think the technology that we enjoy, as much as I use it, and we used it here today, it is the drug of choice. It is the new drug, and we become so dependent on it. God forbid, God forbid, that one satellite goes down. It's estimated that one orbiting satellite over North America that went down would knock down 80 to 90% of the cell calls in this country permanently. They had an interruption the day before Christmas on Electronic Arts where many people go up online to play different games. Now, you may have not even heard of Electronic Arts. It was all over business news because 20 million to 30 million people couldn't log on to play games. It was a, it was a catastrophe. How many of you have heard of Electronic Arts? Eh, a few of you. Boy, a couple of those hands shot right up. The technology that we have is important. It's good for us. But when we read Daniel 12, we want to know the details. We want to know. We want to understand all these things because they're important to us. But it is indeed relating to the knowledge that comes with a very heavy price. It's a dependency on this knowledge because we have to separate the unending knowledge from the worthless knowledge and the good knowledge. Is it knowledge we want or insight, wisdom, and true understanding? I'll give you another example. Many of us I know in this congreg congregation, I love books, way too many books. Recently, uh, someone uh, told me about someone getting rid of a set of Encyclopedia Britannicas. How many of you had a Britannica when you were, when you were a kid? Wow. Um, our family couldn't afford a Britannica. We had the cheap world book, which we still have. So the Britannica was the Cadillac, very expensive. And this person was throwing it out. Uh, when it was new, it was one to $2,000. Uh, I showed my son John. He said, uh, Dad, this is from 1995. I, I said, yeah. He said, you have 33 doorstops. There's 33 volume encyclopedia. I said, what, what, do you, what do you mean? He said, Dad, this is all online. It is? He says, yeah. So is your 11th edition from 1905. So is your 10th edition from 1895. Dad, it's all online. I, I knew that. He said, eBay it. He said, the shipping will cost more than, than the books. What does it say? It says he was right. He was right because nonetheless, I accepted the books, trying to find a place for them. But I have this issue. Is all knowledge worthwhile? Is it important? Does it gain us anything? Does it give me wisdom? Does it make our lives better? So just eBay it. Is indeed the point to collect and compile data, friends, likes, put unlikes, for what? Those of us who say we believe in God and Christ and his truth need all the more listen to Daniel because we're not even done with this book yet. Biblically, there are some things, as we shall see, that are not to be understood. They are not to be understood. When we pile on useless amounts of knowledge and data and information and we don't use it wisely both in our personal life or wherever we may be with our relationships, is it important? I would never, ever stand here and demean Facebook. Seriously. I don't have an account, but I've, at, I've used it. I think it's important. It, uh, so is Twitter or LinkedIn. I've used it. I, we even have Facebook stock. It's fairly good stock. It gives updates rapidly, and I know many of you watch Facebook religiously. No pun intended. I'm not telling you you shouldn't be doing that. 
But can we agree that as with the Britannicas, there's often too much, just too much, and that we need to indeed look up, as Mr. Turk has said. The friends that we have, are they really friends? What an odd term to be used on Facebook. What an absolutely sad term to be used. 200, 400 friends? I don't have two or 400 friends. I have 400 connections or whatever it is on LinkedIn. No, I don't. People are randomly, we now know, they're just connecting with one another because they want to amass the number because it's important. It makes us look important. Oh, look, they've got a thousand friends. They've only met 10 of them. <laughs> they've never laid eyes on most of them, but they've got a thousand. I caution you, as I do myself, to a deception. It is a delusion because indeed the evil one knows technology. The evil one understands far more than you or I technology. So let's continue to read. Daniel's been told to shut up the end of the, the book, that many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase in verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked and there stood two others, one on this riverbank and the other on that riverbank. And one, possibly Daniel, said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. And when the powers of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. And so that's his answer. He asked the question, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? He wants to know. It's natural. It's obvious. Verse 7 says it's enigmatic, but traditionally we've always said that times, time, and half a time were the three and a half years, traditionally a time period, that the church would be kept in abeyance. I won't go into that. You can look that up. But it's after God's people's power has been destroyed or eliminated before Christ's return. What's important here, what's important here is how Daniel responds in the next verse. He could have said very easily, he said, oh, Verse 6, verse 7, now I understand when it's going to happen. After times, time, and half a time. He could have responded that way in Daniel, this very famous book. It's clear, very clear. You've explained it to me. Let's read what he says, verse 8. He says, although I heard, I heard you, I was listening, I don't understand. This is Daniel, the prophet. I did not understand. Then I said, I asked another question, my Lord. What shall be the end of these things? But let's pause and understand that after all these explanations, after 12 chapters of images of beasts and kingdoms, Daniel says, I don't understand. I still don't understand. He then asks the second question in verse 8. He says, what shall be the end of these things? What's, what's the end game here? How long and, and what's going to happen? What's the final result? Tell me that. Tell me what that would be. Note this very interesting answer as we close the end of the book. And he said, the man clothed in linen, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. He repeats it again. But Daniel, you, you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will rise to your inheritance at the end of the days. At the end. Here's the prophet Daniel, who we would see as a prophet of prophets of prophecy. In many ways, he did not understand. And he died, he lived a righteous life, he sleeps now, and he awaits a resurrection. Daniel, go your way. It can be interpreted a number of ways. Um, two in particular I see is indeed Daniel would live out his life. He would die and sleep and be resurrected. He would never know the answer. He died not knowing the answer. But we would conclude that he lived a righteous life. 
After all, he was going to live again. He was going to be resurrected. So he would be one of the righteous. He also would be considered by writing of this book, one of those that we read earlier, that teaches those to righteousness, leads others to a proper path. And the people that he's talking about or talking to in this book is you and me. Understanding is important. What does this say to us? This very simple book, at the end of days, at the end of a, a time we've had here in Eagle Rock, a wonderful time, what does it say to us? It says that the wise would understand. The wise would be patient. And they would have wisdom and not understanding or realizing everything was to be understood. We will not know, brethren, this side of life. The technology says, oh, yes, you can know. You will know. You will all understand. You just need to keep digging and digging. Well, if Daniel didn't understand, then he too had God's spirit. What of us? There will be a time when the kingdoms of man clash and are defeated by the kingdom of God. But as Daniel, we understand that all of this is in God's hands. All of it is in God's control. And yet we conclude that we too should leave, live a righteous life. A life dedicated to God. Realizing we don't understand everything in detail. The more we study, the more we'll understand probably what to do. Let me ask you a question. If I had... If I had my hand right here, the answer, the truth, the times, time, and half time, it's right here. And I understand, and I can give you the understanding of the 1290 and the 1335 days. If I had this information to give to you, how would it change your life? What would it make you do any differently? Would it make you pray more fervently? Would it have you hold your children more closely? Say kinder things to the people that you know and you love? I hope it wouldn't. I hope it wouldn't change your life at all. Because the vast knowledge that we already possess, that we've always possessed, that we get from this book, aside from other technology may give us, should be sufficient for us. And many times I think the technology of this world pulls us and draws us to places we shouldn't be, and to go to places we should not go, and to see things we should not see. It's not important. It wasn't important then when that phone was developed any more than when this phone is being used today. So I'd leave you with just a couple of things. And in fact, I couldn't have asked for a, a better tie-in with the special music hymn. And I think it was, All Will Be Well. That was a very good hymn. It says, All Will Be Well. But let me give you some quick points. As time grows short, whatever short means, we're today closer by one day to the time of the end than we were yesterday or the day before. So whatever time we have, remember this. One day, the technology will fail us. It will fail us utterly. <laughs> did, you, did you guys plan that? <laughs> I think it scared them as much as it uh, got me. <laughs> the technology will, it's time to leave this building, isn't it? Yeah. The technology will fail us. We must always know, as Daniel did, that Jesus Christ and God, the Father, know everything, all the details, all the plans and the subplans and the subplans. And that's what's important, that wisdom and knowledge lead to righteous living. It's not increased. It's not increased by knowing prophecy. It is aided, but righteous living is the goal. It is therefore the relationships that we have not the technology that connects us. It's more important to see someone smile. It's more important to hear their voice, isn't it? Write a letter, write a note, put the phone down. By the way, if you wanna connect, connect with me, just come up and say hi. <laughs>